Spaceship Junkyard Chapter 1 Matthew walked out of the clinic, took a deep breath and, full of anticipation for today's plans, walked out into the car park to the motorcycle his father had given him for his seventeenth birthday. He and Chloe had agreed in history class this morning that he would pick her up after school and take her to the river, but a doctor's appointment had made him a little late. The ride was to the other side of town, to the new neighborhood where Chloe's parents had recently bought a house. Matt put on his helmet, got on the bike, started it up and rode off. The weather was beautiful, the breeze was refreshing and the oppressive heat didn't feel so hot. He rode through quiet, tree-lined streets. There was greenery and flowers everywhere. The air smelled of flowers and freshness. Matthew enjoyed the ride, the city was like a work of art, created with advanced technology and brought to life by skillful engineers and designers. It was a place where architecture met nature, creating harmony between man and his environment. Artificial intelligence, like an invisible artist, manages the life of the city, keeping streets and parks clean, controlling traffic flows and creating comfort for its inhabitants. Automation is becoming an integral part of life, robotic cleaners constantly working on streets and lawns create the illusion of impeccable cleanliness, and autonomous vehicles move lightly and silently through the streets, ensuring the comfort and safety of residents. Buildings imbued with modern technology look like works of art, glass structures wrapped in greenery, like majestic gardens, rise up against skyscrapers topped with energy-efficient panels. Each house is not just a dwelling, but a unique space where modernity meets environmental awareness. The city's ecosystem is striking in its diversity, green parks, cycle paths, green squares where a variety of plants flourish. And in the evening, the lights of the city create a magical spectacle, like stars shining on the earth. This city is a place where modern technology embodies the idea of perfect coexistence between man and nature. Not far from the city was a river with beautiful beaches. Matthew liked to drive around his city at a leisurely pace, enjoying every moment. The augmented reality lenses he was wearing showed the best route to Chloe's house, but he decided to take his favorite streets, even though it took him seven minutes longer. Chloe was standing in the kitchen when she heard the doorbell ring. She gestured with the thumb and middle finger of her right hand to activate the lenses. Immediately the image of Matthew appeared, standing at the front door. Chloe was nervous because Matthew hadn't yet found out that they couldn't go to the river. She walked into the hall and opened the door for him. Her black curly hair fell in light cascades over her shoulders, framing a young, energetic face with chiseled features. Chloe's eyes sparkled like emeralds, reflecting inner excitement and unprecedented determination. She was wearing a light green summer dress that emphasized her slender figure and gave her a light and fresh appearance. Chloe's eyes swept over Matthew's face, reflecting a mixture of joy and slight irritation at his lateness. She stood there with a certain grace, radiating strength and independence, but there was a hint of childlike directness in her eyes that softened the outward severity. The tension in the air dissipated as she smiled welcomingly, and the tone of her voice remained calm but slightly resentful, what took you so long? She asked, deciding that the best defense was an offense. We agreed to be two hours early. I was at my doctor's, Matt replied, his heart beating faster. I got a new version of the earring. I see, Chloe replied quietly, a little annoyed at Matthew for being late. Are you ready? Shall we go? He didn't give up, trying not to provoke her too much. Alas, no. My parents are away on business and I have to look after my brother. You can stay if you want, Chloe replied. Matt was not upset. Oh well, let's look after Brian together. By the way, where is he? In the garage, inventing something again, Chloe replied. Matt went into the garage. Even though the house was only a little over a year old and this garage was designed for three cars, it was already hard to fit one in here. Brian had taken over the garage and turned it into a veritable workshop, filled with the sounds of creativity and scientific discovery. The air was filled with the smell of solder and hot plastic. 
The walls of the garage were lined with shelves containing thousands of different tools, from hammers and screwdrivers to high-tech gadgets. There were huge workbenches with colorful wires, tiered shelves with jars of various parts and fixtures. In one corner stood a massive workbench with a 3D printer whirring away, creating intricate and elegant designs. On a nearby table lay the blueprints for the future inventions on which Brian spent his hours with such passion. At the other end of the garage, an old machine churned out small parts with a smooth and sure sound. It was no less precious to Brian than any other piece of equipment, for it was the machine he used to create the microchips for his inventions. In the center of the garage was a comfortable couch, surrounded by a small table, where Brian and his friends spent their time discussing the latest scientific discoveries and ideas for experiments. Opposite the couch was a side table with two games consoles and a projector, which were used for a well-earned rest after a hard day's scientific research. This garage wasn't just a place for technical pursuits, it was an arena where Brian realized his love of science and creating something new. In short, it was Brian's personal space, but his parents didn't mind. Hello there. Oh, hi, Matthew. Brian looked up from his work and noticed the new earring in Matthew's ear. Wow, you have a new earring. When did you get it renewed? I just went to the doctor. Matt replied with a smile, knowing that Brian would not let that go unnoticed. Well, among other things, this version of the eye hoop does blood work, measures sugar and whatever else is in it. It measures cholesterol, adrenaline levels and more, I've seen the presentation. Apple always set the tone for the gadget market. Brian replied. What are you working on this time? Matt asked as he ditched his rucksack and sat down on the couch. I want to increase the range of Einstein's collar. He runs away a lot. Brian replied. The other day he was running all over the neighborhood. Brian called Einstein his dog and he loved him very much and spent a lot of time with him. Just then, Chloe came into the garage. She brought three bottles of lemonade and a hot pizza. The boys looked at each other and immediately took a slice and started eating. Thank you, Chloe. This pizza is delicious. Brian said when he'd had enough. Matt, look at this, when I switched Einstein's transmitter to a higher communication frequency, it picked up a faint signal coming from a spaceship junkyard. A junkyard of old spaceships? Matt asked. That's impossible. Those wrecks have long since been de-energized, almost all their equipment stripped. He poured himself a glass of lemonade and picked up another slice of pizza. Think about it, Brian, the war ended 30 years ago, all the reactors on those ships have been shut down for a long time, and the batteries would be dead for that long. There can be no signals from there, especially as it is eight miles from our house to that place. Chloe said in surprise. Actually, it's eleven miles. Matt corrected her. Show us what you found. He turned to Brian, now. He replied. A few seconds later, Brian displayed a volumetric halogram. This is our house, and there is a signal coming from here, but it is very weak. It's true. But we've been to this dump a few times, and it's hard to imagine that anything could make a signal there. Matt replied with undisguised surprise. Those spaceships down there are more like a pile of scrap metal. Yes, but the signal is coming from the junkyard. Brian insisted. We've got to go and check it out. Don't be ridiculous, Brian. We're not going anywhere, it's out of the question, the scrapyard is guarded and it's too dangerous. Chloe replied. Brian looked at Matthew, hoping he would back him up. He knew that Matt had been to the junkyard more than once, he and his friends had made about a dozen raids. Matt was the current captain of the high school football team. I think it's worth checking out. If there really is something there, it could be very important. Especially since the junkyard is going to be dismantled in the next few months, all these ships will be taken away and scrapped. Chloe sighed. She knew Matthew wouldn't be persuaded. All right, she said. But only if we go together. Brian and Matt laughed. 
Sure, together. Brian said. We're friends. Then they started to think about how to get there. The junkyard was in a river gorge downstream. The area was fenced off, and security drones patrolled the area constantly. The government had closed off the area to citizens because of radiation and other contamination. We'll go there on my bike, it'll fit the three of us, Matthew said. Remember you gave me your drone, we can use it as a scout to avoid the guards. I'll remember where I put it now, Brian said as he started rummaging through the shelves. Can you tune it to pick up the signal from Einstein's collar? Matthew asked. That will make it even easier for us to find out where the signal is coming from. I've already thought of that. You read my mind, Matt. Brian was already holding the drone in his hands and thinking about how to connect it to his computer. So you really want to go there? Chloe watched the whole thing, perplexed. Why not? It'll be interesting, better than sunbathing on the beach. Matt replied with a smile, then I'll make sure we have water and food for the day, Chloe replied with a sigh of hopelessness. I understand, don't I, that two or three hours won't be enough for us. The catering's a great idea. Brian was already making changes to the signal receiver program. Make us my favorite sandwiches. We should all be dressed as comfortably and safely as possible. Said Matt, no summer dresses, and certainly no open sandals. I've been there a few times and I can tell you it's not the most inviting place. We'll wear trousers and boots. Brian replied. All right then. Tomorrow's Saturday, school's out, we leave at 9 a.m., I'll pick you up. Said Matt, in the meantime, let's get ready and pack, I think it's going to be a great adventure.